Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Matter on the Wine Bar's Quarantine Wine Club and Virtual Tastings and Classes. This is week number four that I've been doing this with you. I appreciate all the support. Um, last week we actually sold out of some of the wine that was being used for the classes, so thank you so much for that. I appreciate very much. Uh, this week the focus will be shifting over back into France to discuss um, a very important noble grape. I think it's very fitting that we discuss this grape at this time. I'll explain why in a few moments. Um, so the, uh, you know the deal, it's two wines to follow along. Uh, $40 for the two wines, the videos are free. It's not the same as attending the wine classes in person. Uh, it's not the same as doing anything in person right now. These are the two wines that we'll be discussing. This is today's wine. This is the Chateau Laulerie 2016 Bergerac Rouge. This is the wine we'll discuss later in the week. This is also 2016. This is a Blay Cote de Bordeaux Chateau Cayetau Bergeron which has an enormous following here. Um, interestingly enough, some wines have a large following in the States because uh, there's no other way of putting it. A lot of people simply don't know any better. They don't even know what they're drinking, um, which is why uh, when you see Americans buying domestic bottles, you see them buying based on the grape type that's on the label, whereas a lot of Europeans, in particular in France, with the exception of sometimes Jura and definitely Languedoc and Alsace where they list the grape type on the label. Other than that, they list the um, region. <coughs> so let's get started. The Chateau Lowry, 2016 Bergerac. Where have we heard Bergerac before? How many know the story of Cyrano de Bergerac? If you know the story, uh, you know, something about a beautiful love story. But as you know, Cyrano is less than attractive physically because he has a very, very long nose. I don't think that's a reason for uh, choosing not to love somebody. I think there are a lot of uh, legit reasons for not loving somebody. But sometimes something as superficial as that is not legitimate. Maybe you're not attracted to somebody, but that doesn't mean you don't love them. We like to say that this wine has a great nose for that reason, because he's Bergerac. What do you know about Bergerac besides Cyrano? Bergerac is considered southwest, sudwest France, which is also where Mataron is, where Cahors, uh, Marciac, and Gaillac are located, among many others. We know that I have a particular affinity for the wines from uh, sudwest, in fact, a lot of the wines that I've been choosing for the wine classes are special to me in one way or another. This is in a part of the Sudwest that I did not visit um, because it's not in the uh, Gascony area. This is in the Dordogne area, the Arondissement. So when we're looking at the Sudwest, we're looking at the area that falls uh, kind of squarely in the middle of where Languedoc, Bordeaux, and the uh, border of Spain meet, so fairly close to the Pyrenees. This one won't be quite as close to the Pyrenees. This will be uh, farther northeast when it comes to uh, Sudwest. So we're actually looking at the area directly east of Bordeaux. So the soil type and the grapes will be more similar in Bergerac to Bordeaux than they'll be to other parts of Sudwest. So we're not looking quite as much at Fair Servadou at Tenant. Things like that, uh, we're not quite looking at those. We're looking more at, um, for reds, we're looking at Merlot. We're looking at Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc. Sometimes some uh, Merlot. And when we're looking at whites, we're looking at uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. And Rosé is also permitted as our sweeter wines, which you'll see coming from near this area is called uh, Montbazia. So um, we are looking at more of a Bordeaux style as opposed to a Sudwest style. And the other one that we'll be looking at is in fact um, a Bordeaux. Uh, when we think of Bordeaux, what do we think of? Well, if we're looking at 
uh, the river going through Bordeaux, we're looking at, um, on the left bank, Cabernet heavy wines, Cabernet Sauvignon that will have some Merlot blended in, also some Cab Franc, and we're looking at also the additions that are permitted, uh, Carmenere, Petit Verdot, and Malbec. When we're looking at the right bank, we're looking at wines that are mostly Merlot and some Cabernet Franc. When we're looking at something like Pomerol, we're looking at something that's just about all Merlot. When we're looking at something like, uh, those will be Pomerol. When we're looking at something more like uh, Saint Emilion, we're gonna see more uh, Cabernet Franc blended into the Merlot like we see in Cheval Blanc. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, that's why this wine kind of shows the best of both worlds. We're looking at something that's sort of Sudwest, technically Sudwest and reminiscent a lot of Bordeaux, just like when we're looking at wines from Sud Tyrol, they remind us a lot of Austrian wines, even though they're technically Italian. So uh, Bergerac, the name comes from the word for britches, the big baggy pants worn by the French gentlemen in those areas. So we're looking at the area near the Dordogne River, um, outside of Bordeaux, just east of Bordeaux. Only about 15% of Bergerac wines make it outside of France. And because of a lot of um, different cultures that took over the area and the practices of the traditional people, there's a strong tie to people who have left Bergerac and move to the United Kingdom or to the Netherlands, which is where we see a lot of the Protestants, French Protestants have moved there. And they have in fact, uh, kind of kept it going, the Protestants supporting Protestants, Protestants selling to Protestants. And so these are more Protestant areas that tend to trade with Bergerac because Bergerac was a Protestant stronghold. Um, grape growing in the area dates back to Roman times, just like most other places over on that side. And then uh, by the Visigoths, the Visigoths like their wine. So we saw a lot of winemaking then. Winemaking suffered under the Vikings and the Muslims made it even worse for them because uh, the Quran forbids the consumption of alcohol, presumably. And so the, uh, the grapevines were actually uprooted. And by the 1200s and kind of into Renaissance times, they had to uh, replant everything and start all over again. But by the mid 1200s to late 1200s, so we're looking at 13th century, um, they started making wine again in the area and formally exporting it. And again, that went into mostly Protestant areas. So we really don't see a tremendous amount of Bergerac in the United States. We see a lot more of it, even though it's only 15% of what's made, the rest of it stays in France. We see about 15% leaving and it is mostly going into the United Kingdom, the Netherlands and places like that. Um, it's uh, what they call oceanic climate. So it's not that hot. Merlot doesn't really like it too hot. It prefers cool soil. Interestingly enough, uh, soil with gravel and with iron clay in it and uh, calcareous. So the soil in those areas is calcareous. It's hilly with iron in the clay mixed with gravel. That's um, the iron influence is coming from farther south. The gravel influence is coming from farther north. And some areas also have some silt in them. Again, with the oceanic climate, we're looking at somewhat cooler, not too hot. There is some rainfall, so we can compare it to other areas. Merlot, a bit about Merlot. Merlot is an older grape for the most part, has a dark blue skin. And in fact, the French word Merle, meaning blackbird, is where Merlot takes its name from. Uh, Merlot is used for making both blends, which we'll see in Bordeaux type grapes. We'll see the blends, which I mentioned, and then we will see them in what they call single varietal, like we'll see today. Varietal is not a grape. Varietal describes making um, a wine out of pretty much just one grape. So they call them single varietal. Don't call grapes varietals. They're not varietals. Even a lot of wine professionals make this mistake. But you know better because you come here and you pay good attention and you're, uh, you're thinkers, I, I would like to believe. And so you know that this is not a varietal. The grape is a variety. There are varieties of grape. A varietal wine is generally a single grape wine. Merlot is good for either one, just kind of like Grenache is also good for that. I like to call them team players. They can work well on their own. They're good self-starters or they work very well 
as a team, which is nice, right? Uh, Merlot has the dark blue skin. It is technically, I believe it's the, uh, the third most widely planted grape in the world. Old world style is harvesting a little earlier when it's uh, ready to maintain the acidity, which we'll notice in this wine. If we're looking at new world styles, we're looking at a later harvest to make a riper, more fleshy wine. Uh, in case you didn't know, old world is generally European. New world is generally like uh, North America, South America, Australia, South Africa, kind of like that. Um, I think that we kind of know the two different styles at this point. Um, Merlot has a lot of fruit character. It tends to be able to preserve the acidity, which is nice for making an age-worthy wine, like we'll see in Pomerol and Saint-Emilion, where it's considered noble uh, on the right bank in Bordeaux. And um, again, in the New World, we'll see something uh, fleshier and riper. It tends to have soft tannin, plenty of fruit, and uh, very present acidity, which we'll see later. Um, a bit more about it, it tends to grow well in France, where his homeland is, and he, um, it's a, a main player and a noble grape in Bordeaux, but we also see it in uh, the Sudwest. We see it also growing successfully in parts of Italy, including in Tuscany, and we'll also see it growing very successfully in more moderate areas of the New World. We'll see it growing very well in the United States, not just on the West Coast, to include California and Washington State. I happen to like it very much from Washington State, but it also grows very successfully on Long Island. So if you wanna support some local businesses soon, might be a good idea to go out East, because I think you can start doing that pretty soon and support their Merlot. Um, a lot of the ones from Long Island are actually not as intense as the West Coast. You'll see them almost more similar to the style of the European wines, which is to say um, even some greener notes and a lot of maintained acidity. Uh, this estate, Chateau Lollery, is owned by the Dubard family. So it's family-owned estate since the 1970s. They are planted um, on the hills facing south-southwest. The hills are right near the Dordogne. The wine is sustainably made and it is fermented and aged in stainless steel tanks. So we're not seeing oak here. So we're not going to see a super spicy wine, right? Okay. I have some serious things to go over with you before this video is over. I know that sounds like I'm making announcements in a classroom or a church. It's very important that you stay until the end of the video because there's some very important things I want to tell you that start with Merlot and end with uh, the current situation. So, Chateau Lollery, 2016. Make sure your label says 2016 because the current release is 2018. What you need, pen and paper for your tasting notes, your bottle, your videos, your wine glass, your white surface. So, this wine's pretty approachable right out of the bottle. This is something we do by the glass here. I kind of like pouring this. We, we do like pouring this. This has been in the Sudwest section by the glass since day one. Hold it against your white surface at an angle away from you. What do you say? I would say a fairly deep red color. I would say it's reflective um, with hints of brightness. Not tremendous variation from the core to the rim because it's not a very old wine. Still, there's some slight pinkishness in the rim and the core is not crazy dark. If you can see your tasting notes or you can see the label behind it, then that means it's on the uh, approachable and ready to drink side, which I would say it's pretty clear right now and approachable. Remember how we test our viscosity for our alcohol content. Remember about um, hotter areas versus cooler areas, very sunny and dry areas versus uh, cooler and rainy areas, and how that increases the sugar levels when the grapes are ripening. And then using uh, fermentation to convert the sugar into alcohol. So we want to test for that. And by that, we are not looking for legs to indicate quality because it's nonsense. I don't even know how that ended up uh, happening, but people are fed a lot of information and they think it's right. Let's give it that good swirl. Breathe into your glass and catch the tears coming down. We'll call them tears, right? Like the Europeans do. They know their wine. Watch the tears coming down. It's fairly viscous, not extremely viscous. If you guessed around 13.5% alcohol, you're correct. 
we'll call that medium to medium plus alcohol content. It's going for the aromas. I love the aromas on this wine. Are they crazy complex? No. Are they really fun and um, very classic style? Yes. You remember those, uh, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, you remember those little chocolates that people gave out at Christmas that have the cherry cordial on the inside? I didn't, I didn't love them as a child. In fact, I used to choke on them. But I would say that there's a lot of chocolate cherry. A lot of people describe Merlot as a chocolate cherry character. I would say dusty cocoa, dusty cocoa powder on cherry. Plenty of cherry, dark cherry, red cherry. That's pretty traditional and what we expect in this wine. Are we also catching plum, berry, blueberry, raspberry, blackberry? A lot of berry. Not crazy spicy, just a little bit of baking spice, maybe a touch of vanilla. Tobacco leaves, remember we discussed that last week, tobacco leaves, some pepper. A lot of dry dark chocolate, maybe even some uh, mushroom, bitter black tea leaves. I would say plenty of mushroom, earthiness, very distinct earthiness. And a lot of savory herbs. Uh, are you feeling any greenness about this? Because this will happen when they harvest some of the grapes early, including Merlot and his sibling Carmenere. Um, about the parentage on this, up until a few years ago, they didn't even know who the mom was. But um, she's from that same area of France. But the dad is Cabernet Franc. So Merlot is a uh, relative of uh, the dad, Cabernet Franc, and also the siblings Cabernet Sauvignon. Carmen Air, which Carmen Air and Merlot kind of remind me of each other a little bit, especially with the early harvest greenness notes, and also Malbec. So they're all kind of living nearby, like we see a lot of families do, if we're lucky. But to me, there's definitely a savory character, a lot of herb. Ready to go in for some, uh, some flavors? I think we can do that. Remember, we want to try to confirm, try to confirm some of the flavors that, uh, that we picked up in the aromas. getting a lot of red and dark fruit. I am. A lot of cocoa powder. It's kind of dusty. Some pepper, vanilla. I would say the, definitely the mushrooms. A lot of earthiness, a lot of forest floor, and a lot of savory herbs. Are you catching some oregano, basil leaf, parsley, things like that? A lot of the uh, bitter and savory herbs. That's what happens when you harvest earlier. You maintain some of that greenness and also some of the acidity. I would say this is a very old school style wine. Would you say there's very present acidity? That's from harvesting at the correct time. Very present acidity. There's still tannin, some present tannin. You can feel that dryness, but I wouldn't say that they're intense. They're pretty well integrated with the, the balance of fruit, acid, tannin. Remember, it's the acidity that will uh, give the wine its posture from an early age and allow it to age gracefully. I would say it's a medium length finish. I would say that this wine would pair very nicely with meats, in particular some charred meats. I would not pair it with anything too intense. You can even do it with um, some heavier fish dishes. I wouldn't say white fish. I would say things like salmon or fish that are done in a uh, more salty or savory sauce. I would not pair this with uh, spicy foods because um, I don't think that it would play very well with them. I think it would come out extremely bitter. And uh, I would say meat dishes with mushroom would be beautiful with this and with herbs. How do you feel about this wine? I like this wine a lot. I think this is, uh, I think it's a true classic. Now, this is interestingly enough, not one of our best selling wines by the glass. I don't have to order this as often as I'd like. I think it's a very good wine. Um, once people have had it, they think it's a very good wine. There's a point I'd like to make. Um, a lot of people claim that they know what Bordeaux is because they've heard the name. It's prestigious, it's very expensive a lot of times, not necessarily all the time, but most of my reserve list here is Bordeaux. It tends to age well. I wish I could have you here for the wine class so I could say raise your hand if, because then I'd say raise your hand if you knew that one of the chief grapes in Bordeaux is Merlot. Also, our Trefethen 
Merlot that we have from California by the bottle. I'm still working on the same case since opening. We've sold very little of it. And the Long Island wines are still sitting on the rack. Most of them are Merlot. When you go into a restaurant, how often do you say, I'd like a glass or a bottle of Merlot? Let's say you grew up around the time that uh, maybe a little bit before Seinfeld. Do you remember when everyone wanted Merlot in Seinfeld? Do you remember a movie called Sideways, a movie that's supposed to be funny? It's supposed to be about wine. The main character is uh, Miles, and he purports to be an expert on wine. <laughs> a lot of people purport to be experts about a great many things, especially these days with the internet, with perceived knowledge, forcing their opinions on people and pretending that they're facts. We tend to rely on experts. Experts. When I went through law school, they discussed expert testimony and how important that was because people purport to be experts at a great many things. Before Sideways came out in the movie theaters in 2004, Merlot was enormously popular probably because it's pretty good. And then uh, the main character, Miles, who claims to know so much about wine, lives for Pinot Noir. I love Pinot Noir too, if it's made well. I especially love it from Burgundy, where it's made very correctly by harnessing what nature gives you that year instead of masking the entire thing in oak and making it flabby. Miles says at one point, no, if anyone orders Merlot, I'm leaving. I'm not drinking any blanking Merlot. Since then, there was a significant decrease in the sales of Merlot. Interestingly enough, the sales of Pinot Noir, which were his favorite, increased. In a way, I want to know how many of you followed that trend, and in a way, I really don't want to know, because I would like to think that my customers are smart enough to think for themselves. I would like to think that that's why you choose to go out to small, interesting restaurants instead of large chains. Because if we don't support the local businesses and restaurants right now, in their hour of need, in our hour of need, in my hour of need, you will be forced to eat Olive Garden and Applebee's forever. If you like that idea, that's fine. I understand. I don't really, but I respect your opinion. Otherwise, it's essential to support the small businesses now. I can't think of any more appropriate wine to pick for this week than Merlot, because I would like to think that people deep down are capable of thinking for themselves. At the end of Sideways, Miles finally opens up that bottle he's been holding. Does anyone remember what it was? It's 1961 Cheval Blanc. It was not his beloved Pinot Noir. It's Saint Emilion. You remember what I said at the beginning of this video? Half Merlot, half Cabernet Franc. Half Merlot. So he wouldn't drink any Merlot, but that wine that he had been clinging to all those years, the one that he finally drank at the end, is at least half Merlot. I thought this expert knew something. I thought this expert's opinion mattered all along. I'm not trying to make this uh, about one thing or another, or am I? But I would like to think that my customers, that many restaurants' customers, can think for themselves at a time like this. Drink Merlot, support your favorite producers, support your favorite businesses, support your favorite restaurants. I don't like having to say this, but the one thing standing between me and my wine bar and ruin right now as a result of this current situation is your support. We need you to think for yourselves as soon as you feel ready to come out to the restaurants whether you're supporting some of the other small local restaurants like Pentimento right now that have outdoor seating and we're able to open starting tomorrow or hopefully in about two weeks from now, Matteron will be able to open again. I cannot keep on going without your support. If you saw what my account looked like right now, 
you would not believe that I was open more than 10 minutes with what I no longer have. Please think for yourself. Don't let restaurants go the way of Merlot. Thank you.